registered to Def Jam, BMG, and Mercury Records. While Sidney was studying finance at, you know, the HU, Howard University, he also worked at the National Endowment for the Arts, a nonprofit organization which landed him his internship at Def Jam. Throughout his years, he has worked with some of the, the best, including Brandy, Aaliyah, T.I., just to name a few, but his current roster includes Wiz Khalifa, B.O.B., Trey Songz, K. Michelle, Boosie Bad, and <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say on her, so uh -huh. <laughs> Sarah, please welcome Mr. Zinn. Next for you, we have Mr. Brandon Jinx Jenkins. He is an editorial producer at Complex Media, writing, producing, and serving as the founding on-air correspondent for Complex News. In daily video segments, interviews, and live on-location reporting, Brandon sheds light on developments in the world of music, pop culture, style, sport, and current events globally. Prior to Complex, Brandon was the content and programs manager at Mass Appeal Magazine, where he has worked on the and the redevelopment of the Massiveville brand, building ex experimental programs and creating prototype video content. He also served as a contributing writer and photographer to both online and print editions of the publication. And before that, he worked at Dukan with both Creative Content Studio and a record label. And also served as an intern for Steve Sue's Translation Media Agency. Brandon, just like myself, is a New Jersey native, you know. Jersey people. Jersey. Jersey, you know, okay, we right here, we here. All right. <laughs> but he is from Morehouse. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Awkward side. <laughs> so Last but not least, Mr. Farrell Martin. He currently oversees the digital content of Death for Radio One's Custer at radio stations in the Washington market, including his favorite top 10 stations. WKYS 93.9 FM and Magic 102.3 FM. The California native regularly produces content for the UrbanDaily.com, NewsOne.com, and the Washington Post. He launched the Slugger.com, a life and style blog geared toward urban gentlemen, and he has a bachelor's degree in journalism from you know what? The best Howard University. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Farrell Question, you guys can just answer as you feel, just to let our audience know what they can do to be in the seats that you're sitting in in the future. So, my first question for you is when and where did your career in the entertainment industry begin? Like, how was your start? And what, do you, what advice do you have to give our audience? Um, okay. Let me see how I can make this as brief. I have a long story. I'm kind of long winded. Um, it was, let me see, finance major, going to school. Um, my interests were in everything but the school of business. Um, I hung around with everyone from fine arts to um, communications, and it wasn't until people around me saw that, okay, what are you doing in finance? You need to be in something else. I used to watch them go and get jobs in different areas, internships in BET and radio station. I'm like, oh, no, I can't do that. I got to do, I, I'm a finance major. I came here. I'm going to Wall Street. But that wasn't my interest. And so a record company came to town, uh, Def Jam, to promote. And my friends and fellow students said, you know what? We signed you up. You're going down. No, 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 I can't go. I, you know, I can't get credit for it. It doesn't make sense. They forced me to go. I went, and it was like the clouds parted. The guy came in, started talking about the record company and all the different departments. And at that point in my life, I never thought about the different, uh, the behind the scenes of the music business. I thought that you had to be the singer, the dancer, the actor, the person in the front. I never thought about the, the business side. But when the guy came in, he started talking about all different departments and I'm like, wow, I can do, I can keep my area and still go into the music business. I never thought of it that way. And so since that time, I said, okay, I switched my whole train of thought and, and was like, okay, let me go into the music business. And I just started investigating internships and how I got my internships were, I just took my favorite CDs at the time, turned it over on its back 
And on every CD, it has the address, um, the company that the artist belongs to. Way back then, there weren't any computers when I was here. And so, <laughs> the internet didn't exist. And so, I just, um, I had a job in the government downtown, and I had an office, I had a cubicle, I'm going to school, and I had access to a phone. And I'm from New York, and so I said, you know what, I just, um, I took my top five CDs, said, okay, I just called the human resource department at that company, and said, uh, I'm from New York, and I'll be coming back to home for Christmas, and or whenever, summer, can I get an internship? They said, a lot of them said no, some said yes, Fax me your resume, send my resume, got two internships, and then uh, fast forward when um, I continued my relationship with the people I worked with, and when a job came up, I applied for it and got it, and I've been with Atlantic Records ever since. Unusual, most people don't spend a lot of their time or most of their career at the same place, but I've been lucky enough. To, to be at the same company for, I, I don't know how old you guys are. About 2021? 19 to 21. Yeah, I've been at that place for 18 years. Wow. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's my story in a nutshell. Um, my story, I guess it kind of started before I was even going to Burlington College. My interests were, you know, magazines from early age. My parents got me magazine subscriptions, um, some of the comic books. Um, I used to play basketball, skate, rap music, all that stuff. I grew up in New Jersey, so High 97 was like, yeah. like Funkmaster Flex is like, that's my starting point, you know? Um, and I went to school um, to be an engineering major, which was, um, which wasn't the way, I just, I went to school, you know, I was really good at science and math, I like these things, and you know, and it seemed like a prestigious, um, a prestigious major, like my family liked the way it sounded. So I did that, and then um, it was terrible. Like school was killing me the first two years. Uh, I'm still kind of stuck that you guys got really quiet with more <laughs> um, And school just kind of had me, um, you know, I actually wanted to leave. I actually wanted to come here because you guys had a uh, sure, meeting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to come here because you guys had a media department that we didn't have, and I wasn't going to do the, um, the Clark thing. So I ended up. Um, struggling in school and I spoke to a dean because I was pretty much like, yo, I'm, I'm on my way out. And um, he asked me what I was into and I told him, you know, rap music, you know, I do party flyers on the side, I'm, you know, blogging, doing all these things. Things that he probably didn't even really understand at the time, but he knew it was media. And he told me, um, you know, go check out the marketing department and, you know, tell me that you want to speak um, to this professor who was trying to start this advertising program. And that was the closest thing we had there. So, um, I went, I went and spoke with her, and she was new, and I was new, so we just clicked. And um, from that point on, it just, it, it woke something up to me. I was like, wow, you can get a job doing the things that you like. Crazy. Yeah, and Crazy. it is. It's like that realization, because up until then, you're just following orders. You know, mm -hmm. Every year up until college. It's like, there's, it's preordained what you're going to do. The scary part is like, oh man, what happens after? And um, this teacher just took me under her wing, and I mean, I just, I was definitely one of the better students in her class, and you know, it, it just and not because I was super studious, but just that it, I was home and I woke up. I spent two years just being basically asleep, and it changed everything for me. Um, afterwards, I ended up pursuing um, different advertising gigs. I ended up getting uh, Steve Stout. I tried to. Um, we wanted to come speak at our first ever marketing panel, and this is when I knew I was going to do this stuff. He, uh, we had no money for him. We had no money to get him down there. No money from the state. And we kept calling him, trying to get him to come. And he was like, look, man, you know, I'm very busy. I would love to come, but you guys got to give me something. And my professor was like, yo, you just call him. And I was like, what? She's like, you just call him and leave a message. Like, what should I say? She's like, just say the stuff you say to me in the hallway. And I called him. And I wish I could remember what I said. Because whatever it was, he called back an hour later. He was like, yo, I'm going to show up, but I want to meet the kid who called him. And he showed up. Um, we had a great time. He did the panel. And he was like, yo, I'm going to give you an internship. And he brought me to New York. And um, I worked at Translation when it was only like 20 people. It might be like a 200 person company now. And um, because it was only 20 people, I got really hands on. I got to do a lot of cool stuff. Got shook because I had a full time job with Nestle for sales and dipped. And I probably should have stayed, but I mean, things I guess are working out. 
and I left. And I wouldn't do that job. They gave me so much money, company car, relocation fee. Yeah, I was, I would drive back to New York to blow all my money in the club and then go back to Lake Erie. They have me in Lake Erie, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that was the moment I knew that I couldn't do anything else but be in this world. Because I had money, you know, I was, the boxes that my parents wanted me to check, I had checked, but I was really unhappy. Um, I think it was mutual, and that's decided that I wasn't going to be there anymore. And um, I kind of made that decision around the same time they were like, you got to go. And I ended up just kind of being back home. And uh, a friend, this is why I said it started before I went to school, a friend found an internship opening at Decon Records. Um, it was like a small indie record label. They actually put up um, J Electronic, was really the only track that's on record. Um, and she said, you know, you've always talked about this stuff. We were in high school, you wouldn't shut up about it. You want a job. And then I just ended up working there for free. And it took me to Mass Appeal, Mass Appeal Records, eventually to Complex, so, yeah. Uh, I've been talking two hours. <laughs> <laughs> hey. oh, yeah. Uh, you guys want to know how I got my start. Um, so I kind of started with Rough Riders where I was, um, doing the street team stuff here in D.C. while I was a student. I was like, back when they used to have Dream Nightclub and, and Love, or whatever it was. Sure. Time, we were, the street team dudes used to hand you the, um, the flyer when you was coming out the door. And I would, uh, you know, as far as the Rough Riders, I would, I had a, I had a friend who worked with him, he just put me on, and we used to go all over the city and put up snipes, you know what I'm saying, like little posters all over the city. This was before, this was when it was big back in the day, um, and you wouldn't get fired. But, um, well, actually did, but now. now it, it, they don't do it anymore, but um, so from there, I was just like the street team guy, and then I, my, and I was writing. I, I was just always writing a little bit, you know. I was just writing for whatever reason. I was always reading little, you know, like I said, Source Magazine and Double XL and all that. And I, I had a friend who was a graphic designer. He went to Hampton, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> he uh, he graduated. He, he's from D.C. and um, and he was best friends with uh, with Delonte, um, who was Trey Song's manager at the time. And what happened was they knew I was writing. I was doing like this little freelance stuff for like local papers or whatever. And um, he started this magazine really. Um, he was a graphic design guy who had a bunch of different club clients. And what they would do was like he, he would uh, design the little club flyers and the party flyers. And he came up with the idea to put it, it all in one little magazine. Like uh, instead of having when you go out the door and you hand them a flyer, they throw it away. I'm gonna put them all in like this little, it was like a little club party pamphlet, I guess you would call it. It was like this little fold out joint. And um, I guess my one of our mutual friends decided to put us together, like introduce us. He's like, yo, my man, he does a lot of these little journalism things. He didn't know what it was called. He was just like, you know, he writes. And I'm like, yeah, let's, I was like, yeah, we should put content in there. And I didn't know how I was gonna get at nobody, but he's like, yeah, I know this kid that's, that's coming up, his name is, his name is Trey. I'm like, Okay, I go to Howard, Howard Homecoming coming up. We all had people coming through campus. So what happened was my first interview was doing Howard Homecoming during the office. And I kind of told the story a little bit, but it was Kanye West. And um, nobody, he was just kind of like, you know, nobody took him serious. You know, he was open up for Tyler Quali or whatever. And he was a producer who wanted to rap, you know, and I was like, I'll interview And And um, he got booed, actually. He got booed at Howard at your office. And, um, but I interviewed him. Like I put him on my on my magazine, and then we gave Trey Songs his first cover, and he was a rapper, like I said, and um, it just kind of stopped from there. So we started this thing called Streets Magazine, and it kind of grew to 100,000, uh, well actually 60,000 copies um, up and down the East Coast, outside of New York. We didn't really do New York too much. We did Philly on down to Atlanta, um, and it did what it did. It was a 100-page glossy, and from there I went on the Giant Magazine and on the Radio One. Well, as the audience is always trying to seek careers in the entertainment industry, what tips can you give them about seeking internships or jobs without having the proper experience? I already told you that. <laughs> so do you think internships are the only way to get into business? Or, because some of us aren't, like I'm personally a political science major, and I've been working at uh, the White House for almost a year now, and I hate it. What do I have? Yeah, this is boring. Sorry, y'all. And I'm talking high into the entertainment industry without having the proper experience. I would say you guys are thinking like there's some boundaries that exist that don't really exist. Mm -hmm. Like, 
I went to school to be engineer, you know, to be engineer, and then eventually went to marketing. I'm not really doing that now. You know, I I fell into journalism. You know, media was one thing I always wanted, but these boundaries don't really exist. You're you're probably thinking that way because your life's been so structured until this point. Mm -hmm. So you go to school, you know what time your class is, you know what to expect as soon as you get in. There's a syllabus, there's a teacher. That stuff evaporates after May. Like your senior year, it's just gone. And it, it just does not exist anywhere else. Even if you have a corporate job, like there's still structure, but there's a lot of room to wiggle around and, and finesse what you want to finesse. So I would say one of the bigger things is starting. So there's a spot that you want to go, you know, whatever the equivalent for that, whatever the equivalent today is as taking your favorite CDs and flipping them over and finding out where these offices are and who to contact, do that right now. That's the best way to do it. They're not going to, if you're a hard worker or your work precedes you or you just sound like you're really, you're really hungry on the phone, if the person in the other end can use you or they need you, something will happen. You know, it's, it's, they're not going to say, whoa, 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 you work at the White House? Nah, that's not going to work. That's just, that's not real. I mean, and if that does happen, it doesn't mean stop and just keep going. It changed so much for me personally. Um, the way I see the media, what I feel like I'm charged to do, the way that I view the society that we live in, how we treat each other. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it was the first time I felt like I was doing something really important. You know, I've had some big interviews, I've had some interviews that bombed, I do this video stuff every day. But it was the first day I, and it sounds cliche, but it's real, man. I felt like we were looking at each other. These guys would never talk about rap music all day. We were like, yo, man, we feel like we're doing something that's important. We feel like this is this is right, or we're, we're talking about something other people aren't talking about, completing the story. And um, it's something I never had on my radar whatsoever, and it popped up. Mm -hmm. and. It, yeah, I gotta say it changed my life. Um, for me, my biggest L was, okay, so prior to Radio 1, like I said, we ran this magazine. <clears throat> the magazine, uh, it, was, it was during the recession or whatever, the bottom fell out of the magazine industry. The uh, vibe had closed up or whatever. We didn't have no money to print. <clears throat> so we were like, you know, we're gonna go digital. So we started, we made the decision to stop printing and go straight digital. Okay, mind you, I knew nothing about digital. I'm the digital guy knew nothing about digital at this point. Um, and what happened was we had a designer, uh, a, a developer that we were working with, and he became a partner with it. It was me, my man Chris, who was the publisher, and um, this, this other dude, his name is Ken. And he was a developer. He worked for the government. He was a developer, this, that, and the third. He developed the website for us, and so we just kind of just kept. I kept writing and feeding them like we did videos and fed, you know we didn't know nothing about the, the the technical side. And one day he just got top fed up because we weren't making a lot of money at this point again. You know we were all the money we were making were from print magazines and the digital. We didn't know nothing about the digital game. We were working with a lot of local advertisers at the point at, the, at this time, and they just didn't get the digital side. We like. We didn't know nothing about it. So I think um, what happened was he just quit one day and wanted to be a rapper. <laughs> and he left us high and dry. So he, Streets Magazine folded because the developer wanted to be a rapper and I didn't know nothing about it. Yeah, where is he today? It's still working for Still trying to be a rapper. He's still trying to, I think he just, matter of fact, he entered a rap contest that we did at my station. Wow. So I could have, he wanted to open up for um, Rock the Bell. I mean, they ended up canceling him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, he submitted it. I was like, oh, Kevin. I was like, Kevin, what the heck? Yo, what's up? How you been? You know? But he entered a contest that I was doing for a regular. It just came full circle. It was funny. But he, just, he had like three kids now in the house. And, you know, he's, he's doing okay because he works for the government and all that. But he ended up never became in that, you know, that rap dream never materialized. Um, but what happened was at that point, because remember I, I kind of said the chess game, you know, treat it like a chess game. I was short sighted because I didn't know that part of my business. I was running a business which I didn't know a part, you know, I, I didn't know, so if he decided to just stop, it is what it is. It's kind of like if you're riding a horse, mm -hmm. you're riding this, this artist or whatever, and he decides he don't want you to be his manager no more, what you gonna do, right? It was that type of deal. So it was me not, not knowing what my next move was gonna be without these people. Even with this, this agency I'm doing now, I know everything. I train myself from digital, I, I know how to build websites now, I know I'm a digital, you know, I know all this stuff. At first I was just a writer. Now I know how to, you know, I know how to do video. I know 
uh, how to build websites. I know how to code. I know how to. Um, I know about SEO. I know about. I'm doing digital strategy for for you know all these di different people now. But so that was my low point for me. That low point was every, I lost everything. It was I didn't have no no business. I ain't had no none, nothing. So that was my low point. My high point was one was owning owning a magazine. The same. I built something that that did okay. But I think you know you work at the White House. But for me, as a non you know, from a non-entertainment standpoint, I was one of the last people to interview Dorothy Hyde before she died. And another one, I was able to cover Barack Obama in the White House as a, as a, as a White House correspondent. I was the only black dude in there. Um, those were my, for me, my highlights, because I did a lot of the entertainment stuff. Like, like he said, you know, we did a lot of, we interviewed all these different people, but I guess you kind of get used to that. But I think from a non, you know, I, 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 I was able to interview the, or not, I was able to cover the first black president in the White House, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I was able to do it as the only black journalist, White House correspondent for that day. That was one of my, I can, I can go to, and there's pictures, like I found myself, I went to msnbc.com, and I, and I looked at the video, and I screenshot it, and I colored just my little head, <laughs> and everything was black and white, and I put that, and I framed that on my wall. No, that, that's my yeah. career highlight, um, yeah. yeah, through rap music. B O B when um, they had the uh, DNC did for Brock's um, first tournament. They called him down to perform, and uh, um, he came out. They B O B performed, and then they lined us up. I said, "Okay, he's gonna come out. He's gonna go down the line and you say your name and you meet him." <laughs> And I was on the end, so he came all the way down to the other side, came one by one, met us all, shot my hand. He came and he was like, what's up, what's up, what's up? What's up? <laughs> I'm like, wow. And I'm like, to think that like rap music got me here, yeah. it's insane when you just you sit back and think about it. I never would imagined. My last final question for you guys, because we soon have a training page. Um, as a black man in the industry, what challenges or advantages it's a challenge. It, what, what we do, what I do, is, is challenging. I always say that our industry is in a state of emergency um, in terms of the culture. Um, you can see, I don't know if you all watched the American Music Award last night, where the lack of or black was an accessory. Mm -hmm. um, not to be on a whole pro-black thing, but it, 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 we're in a state of emergency, and it's, it's, it's not just one thing, it's not just music, it's just the, the culture. Mm -hmm. And I tell people a lot of times, like in my history at Atlantic, I think I am the first, Atlantic's been around for about over 60 years, mm -hmm. I'm the first black male publicist. At Atlantic Records, and still the only one um, in a department of. I think we have the biggest department in the music business, probably around 16 people throughout the country. Um, a black female, and he's on the West Coast, and myself. There's been interns and people that work under me. They came up and became interns, I mean became wow. publicists and at other companies, but at Atlantic, I'm the only one. And when I come here and I say, you know, I speak to you guys and um, I only got to the first row. But a lot of times, um, a lot of you all say you're journalists, you want to be publicists, you're writers. Um, and I say that's great. Um, I applaud you. Something happens. From the time that I leave here, when I get back, um, you all disappear. I don't know what it is. I don't know if you get discouraged, or it's too much of a challenge, or you just go into other areas. But um, a lot of people that I deal with on, on a whole, I mean, he can attest, but a lot of people that I'm running or, or reporting um, about the culture, a lot of them, most of the time, are not black. Um, and a lot of times when 
you know, we're looking to hire people. Um, it's hard because I don't know, we don't know where to find you guys. You know, because a lot of time who comes to us are other people. You know, and we have to make a conscious effort to hire black people. And that shouldn't be the case. You know, when I was in school, I went, oh, um, what am I going to do? How am I going to find a job? And, you know, where are the opportunities? There are opportunities out there. You just have to find them. You have to look. Jobs are, you know, they're opening all the time. But you just have to be, you have to make yourself known and be in front of our faces. Um, Lost my train of thought. But long story short is that you gotta do what you gotta do to get to us. To keep to keep the cycle going. You know, I, I sort of have an unofficial um, internship program. Like I make sure each semester that there is somebody from Howard in our office. It's a challenge. And it's a fight every semester, but it's, it's my goal, you know, to, to make sure that there's somebody from Howard there every semester. I do the same thing still. You know, and no disrespect to the females, but again, I say I, females are in front of me all the time. Men are not. And I know guys want to do uh, writers and, and want to be publicists, but it's a challenge to find you guys. And I say to my, my assistant and people in the office, find me a black male. <coughs> when a position opened up at my job, I'm very off the topic. A position opened up at my job and they wanted to hire another publicist and they wanted to find they wanted to find black horses. It was the hardest thing in the world. People want to do marketing, people want to do advertising sales, but publicity, or someone that's qualified that knows how to present themselves, to talk the proper talk, that not too street, or you know, whatever, it, it, it's the hardest thing to find. And I don't know why. You know, so I I just challenge you guys when I leave here, just to stay committed, stay aggressive, and, and be diligent in, in trying to get into business. You know, because you guys are the future, and we need you guys. Everything he said is um, completely true. Um, and what I do think is dope is that at Complex, every semester there is a kid from <coughs> Every semester, mm. uh, typically it's the girls. Um, mm -hmm. I came here last month to speak to a journal uh, magazine panel, and there was one dude in there, and he runs the school paper. It's Dan. Um, mm. Like, but in, and to his benefit, I remember him, and I'll probably always look out for him just because he was there and he was present, you know. Um, and it's weird for me because I went to Morehouse, so there's just a sea of dudes, you know. So you're like, ah, and you don't. And it's cats that I would talk to, and they wanted to get in this world, and we had no clue how to get there. And between that point of not knowing how to get there and actually getting there, where does everybody go, right? Like you guys are here right now, but will you stick with it? Will you kind of fight through it? Mm -hmm. When he's talking about what the publicist thing is completely true. Most times it's a, uh, in this order, it is a white woman, black woman, well, that's probably black woman and white male kind of interchangeable. And then the last person is like a black guy. And it's funny to me because most of the artists are black dudes and they just, it's, you think that there'd be some type of bridge, but there's something that happens in the professional realm where people don't, I, I don't know what it is. And the idea about the culture, everything, the things that you guys enjoy are not being, the strings are not being pulled by people that look like us. It's just, it's crazy. It's not, I mean, I look at, you know, uh, where I work, where I worked, you know, Mass Appeal, whatever you think about that outlet, like, there's a dude, Sasha Jenkins, a really good dude, great writer. Mm -hmm. He's um, he goes, all right, so he has to forget. <laughs> he's nuts, but he's a man, you know. And he's he 
he's one of the few. And that's because that operation is so hands-on and it's a skeleton crew. You know, complex, like, if you look at like prominent black males out of there, it's crazy, but I would elect myself just because I'm so, I'm in, I'm in the camera so much. But as far as like who's governing the system, you know, it's crazy because like, you, got, you guys are growing up off this. What are you guys taking in? You know, what's baked into the message? It's insane. And, uh, so, uh, um, you know, but it's like, it, it's, it's wild. And most places I go, it's, it's like this everywhere, you know. And this place spoils you and it creates a reality that in some ways isn't real. You are spoiled. You will walk out of here and it won't be like this again. You know, it just won't. You wouldn't. It sounds dark, but it's like you will never be in, in the collection of this many ambitious, smart, and powerful black people all at one time, mm -hmm. all with these great ideas, all with these like superb mindsets. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to be out in the real world, and you're going to be fending for yourself. Mm -hmm. And someone's going to say something slick, something that they don't even know is questionable. Mm -hmm. And you will deal with that every day. In this realm, they will. I mean, it's like going to a concert, and you look to your left, and my man's rapping Schoolboy Q, but every word is nigga. And mm -hmm. That is, that's, it's, it's symbolic of what you will encounter. And just going forward, wherever, wherever you go, if you decide not to go and meet here, you know, here, this isn't, I'm not gonna say it's not real, this would be great if this was like, you know, it's utopia. You will get out of here and wherever you go. It's boomerang. Yeah, he'll be. <laughs> it's a boomerang. But I mean, that, this is why I came here. Exactly. Because I, I came from the uh, first black family in a white neighborhood. Um, first black kid in, in the classes, and so when I got here, it was black city. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I never had all, growing up, I had one black teacher. I come from a black neighborhood in California, then I came to a black school at Howard, well, mm -hmm. white high school, the black school in Howard, <laughs> then I graduated, worked for the black press, <laughs> then I worked for the black, for the biggest black media, company in, in the country. So for me, I, and I'm still connected to Howard since I work up the street or whatever, so I didn't have the same experiences for that a lot of you guys might have when you guys leave here. You guys are gonna go work for corporate America who's gonna be, you guys are gonna be one of the very few black folks. For whatever reason, it just always went, I'm very black in regards to my experience <laughs> professionally. But I always,